I don't think I have to do much uh, to introduce Opal Lee. Um, I could say that I have known her for certain years. I got a chance to uh, support her as she's walking up uh, in the walk back in 2017, I think. Uh, that was the first time I got a chance to, to meet her and Dion as they were running the campaign. Um, and this was in the local community uh, over in Fort Worth. So they do a lot of Juneteenth events in Fort Worth and I've been able to connect to those uh, and her over the years. So I'm super excited uh, to have them here as we get ready to start the, the interview or the questions and answers. So thank you for being here again, Opal Lee and her granddaughter, Miss Dion Sims. Uh, we are hosting this in Dallas uh, where you know, you're originally from the North Texas area. So let's start. And I'll ask this question and you can hit me if you want to. Okay. Um, but we'll ask the question of, uh, give me your story, just two or three minutes. But I know your age kind of expands a little longer from the start. If you don't mind starting us from the beginning, where are you from? And, and give, a, give, give everybody a little bit of history about you. And, and then we can start to go from there. Well, I got to say first, good afternoon, young people. Good afternoon. <laughs> And you're all young people if you're not 96. <laughs> and this young fellow wants to know. <laughs> In two or three minutes. In two or three that, minutes. That was, that was the thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Marshall, Texas was where I was born. Uh, spent summers with my grandparents in Texarkana, Arkansas. And so my grandparents and my mom were the people that I guess I'm going to say taught me everything I knew. Oh, my grandfather was a little short man, five feet or so, on a horse, his little legs stuck out like that, you know. But what he said, and everybody listened, that E.F. Hutton didn't have nothing on my grandpa. Everybody would come to the Reverend Broaders, Z brought us Z for Zachary. If they needed tools, if they needed seeds, if they needed advice. And do you know, he'd take people to my grandma. They had 19 children and he'd bring somebody else and tell them that's it. Find some food and some clothes and give him something to do. And when my mom married and moved to Marshall, He'd send somebody up there and tell her, I'll look after them till they can get on their feet. Well, I tell you, I think some of, I don't know what you call it, DNA, kind of rubbed up on me or something. And I grew up in Marshall, Juneteenth, we go to the fairground. There'd be music and food, speeches and food, games and food and food and food and food. <laughs> when we moved to Fort Worth, not so much. People sort of, you know, celebrated with their families. But I met Mrs. Rolla, Lenora Rolla, in her 90s, tall, didn't wear glasses. The city of Fort Worth had asked her to gather all the material that blacks had contributed to the growth of Fort Worth. She couldn't find anything written, absolutely nothing. So she started the Tarrant County Black Historical and Genealogical Society. I'm one of its members. Juneteenth's one of its programs. And we had this tiny little park, Sycamore Park. The paper says we had a Juneteenth with 30,000 people, 10,000 people a day in tiny little Sycamore Park. Oh, did we have fun. The Historical Society took some exhibits. I don't think anybody paid much attention to them. And we knew when a plug was pulled around 10 o'clock, time to go home. This particular time when they pulled the plug, I got on a flatbed truck and put it back 
kid. We parted till dawn. <laughs> oh, did we have fun. Now, there was Dr. Ronald Myers, medical doctor, minister, and a jazz musician all rolled into one. And Dr. Myers was adamant about Juneteenth being a national holiday. In fact, he's responsible for at least 42 of the states having some kind of Juneteenth celebration. Well, I think Doc might be looking down now and saying, it's about cotton picking time you got it done. <laughs> I'm 89, nearly 90 years old, and I've raised four children. I've gone to colleges and universities. I, I taught third grade so long, eight-year-olds, I was beginning to act like them. So they gave me another position. <laughs> I ended up being the uh, visiting teacher if a child needed shoes or clothes or a place to stay or utilities off, just keep him in school. And when I retired from that, that stuff followed me. Um, people still needed clothes and shoes and a place to stay. So we started. I, I, what happened was I belonged to a food bank that burned. And here's this huge facility behind my house. And I had nerve enough to ask for it. They leased it to our little group for $4,000 a month, and I nearly had a hemorrhage. Where we gonna get it in for? <laughs> we paid it for 11 months, and the month we didn't have it, the people who owned it came to us and said, you're doing an extremely good job in this neighborhood. We know you're feeding 500 families a day. And they gave us that $1.3 million facility. I tell you, I could have done a holy dance, but that's another thing. I'm well, going to transition to another question. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Okay, I'm going to transition. Because I'll to ramble. Well, yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand. <laughs> what does the theme, this is the theme from Google, um, what does reflections of freedom mean to you? See, I got to tell you about a General Gordon Granger making his way to Gaveston with several thousand colored troops and telling the people there, the enslaved, that they were free. You see, the president, Abraham Lincoln, two and a half years early with the Emancipation Proclamation had declared that the enslaved were free. Nobody in Texas told them. Them people wanted their crops and stuff. And so when he made his way to Galveston, and old soldiers went around telling people that the enslaved were free, and he nailed this general order number three to the door of what's now Reedy Chapel AME Church. And those people came in from what they were doing and somebody read that to them. They started celebrating, and we've been celebrating ever since. So, did that answer your question? I think it answered it. Okay. About celebration, and I love that. So, one of the things I was going to ask, but I think you alluded to it a little bit earlier, but I'll give you a chance to answer it a little, little, little better. What was your favorite memory of Juneteenth? And I think you will say <laughs> food, but you let us know what you think. <laughs> Oh, I've had some good Juneteenth. And that one that I told you about, that was really nice. But you see, we've got Juneteenth now where I decided that if a little lady in tennis shoes was walking 1,400 miles from Fort Worth to Washington, D.C., somebody would take notice. Cause I think maybe some of Doc rubbed off on me, and I felt like Juneteenth ought to have been a national holiday. 
And so I started out. I walked from Fort Worth to Arlington, to Grand Prairie, um, Dallas, Joppa, Box Spring. My team decided you will be doing it like that. And the reason was somebody had offered us an RV so I'd be able to have to rest. They decided what I was doing was too political and they kept their ORV. Well, people were so good to me. I'm in Shreveport. They take me to Texarkana. Somebody from Texarkana takes me to Little Rock. I was carried all over St. Louis, all over the place. And if I left Fort Worth, like um, September 2016, I actually got to D.C. January 2017. We had asked President Obama to walk with us from the Frederick Douglass House to the Capitol. He was in Chicago. I didn't get what I wanted, but P. Diddy helped me get a million five hundred thousand signatures. <laughs> we took those to Congress, and we were ready to get that many more when we got Dion got the call to go to the White House. <gasps> oh, I tell you. I could have done a holy dance, but the kids were, when I try, I'm twerking, whatever. <laughs> that's your question. No, that's a beautiful response there. And now, I'm glad you went there. One of the questions I had, what, what was your inspiration? I know that you, you, you had a lot going on. You were closing out your career. You raised family. You raised children. What was the inspiration of, of doing the march? What, what really motivated you? I don't know whether to tell you this was an inspiration or not. When my parents moved to Fort Worth and they bought a home in a neighborhood where we weren't wanted, um, my mom had this house fixed up so nice, but on the 19th of June, some 500 people gathered, the papers said, and the police were there. And the police said they couldn't control the mob. My dad came with a gun. And the police told him, if you bust a cap, we'll let this mob have you. Our parents sent us to friends several blocks away, and they left under cover of darkness. Those people told that place asunder. They drove the furniture out and burned it. They did despicable things. Our parents never, ever disgusted with us, never, ever. So I'm not sure if that is what started me on. I will tell you that my grandmother, OK, I'm going to tell you what really got her. President Obama was fixing to leave office in 2016 and she wanted to talk to him. So the inspiration was time. It really was. It was time is of the essence. And when she came to me and said that she, she wanted to walk to DC um, to talk to President Obama to see how come it hadn't been made up a, a, a holiday in eight years, I said, Grandeur, you, you know that's 1,440 miles. He'll be out of office by the time you get there. She said, oh, I'm not going to. I'm not gonna have to walk that long. I'm not gonna have to walk that long. Um, he's gonna call me once he sees I'm walking. And, um, but anybody knows the back half of 2016 was full of political you know, elections and stuff. And so it did not rise, I think, to the, to the attention that you know, we wanted. We did get a lot of uh, good press, but the, but the bee in her bonnet was to get to President Obama. And um, uh, she said it was just taking too long to, to see it made a national holiday. Oh, that's beautiful. Let me go to the next question. Um, how did you feel to see your dream realized and actually witness the signing of the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act by Bill, uh, by President uh, Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris? 
oh, I'm still in awe. I still pinch myself to see if it really happened. And the fact that we have the bill signed, it's going to be on the calendars. Everybody's going to know something or want to know something about Juneteenth. And I am adamant that they don't think it's a Texas thing or a black thing. Freedom is for everybody. And our Bible tells us that we are a brother's keeper. And I think that it's our responsibility to see that people know what freedom is because we aren't free yet. There's joblessness and homelessness and health care that some of us can get and others can and climate change that we are responsible for. If, if we don't do something about climate change, we all go in the hell in a handbasket. We must remember that this can be the greatest country in the world. So hey, I'm going to tell you, all you young people, make yourself a committee of one to change somebody's mind. You know people who aren't on the same page you are on. Change their mind. And it's not going to happen in a day. It's going to take time. But if people have been taught to hate, they can be taught to love. And it's up to you to do it. On that note, what was some of your... No, you... Oh. On that note, what were some of your biggest challenges during this whole process? And what were some of the biggest rewards? I know the signing, of course, but throughout the journey, what were some of the biggest challenges and some of the most exciting moments? See, if I tell y'all that I ain't had no challenges, you ain't gonna believe me. I had one man I tried to hand the flyer and he wouldn't take it. And I decided he was late to work and he didn't have time to fool with me, you know? Everybody had been so nice. Everybody. And maybe it's cause I'm old, you know, and they decided, you know, humor her or something. But the fact that people are listening that people understand that none of us are free until we're all free. I could keep saying that over and over again. You are not free if your friend or your brother or your somebody, if the other people aren't free, we're all in the same boat. So it's left entirely up to us to make these United States, the best country in the whole wide world, and let others follow what we are doing. I like it. How has Juneteenth in this process changed your life? Just to kind of give others as an example. Um, well, ooh, we used to have the festivals, we used to have the food and the music. Ooh, and some games, and we were happy campers. But we begin Juneteenth in Fort Worth with a breakfast of prayer. I don't mean a prayer breakfast where you're gonna sit down and eat a lot of food, but to thank God for how far we've come and ask him to let us make some more progress. So. And it has changed. Besides the breakfast of prayer, we have your voice unleashed where the youngsters from different cultures get together and do the mime and the music and the art and all these good things. They practice a whole week and then they give a concert. There are so many other things. Dion, tell them the other things that are happening with Juneteenth.
Well, we've already had our Miss Juneteenth pageant and um, our reigning queen was actually the national pageant uh, winner for 2023. She'll be finishing. Matter of fact, um, she just got an award that um, Michelle Obama um, highlighted on her Instagram, Madison Corzine. Um, but we now have a new Miss Juneteenth uh, DFW 2023. Um, our Empowering You is the um, educational component of Juneteenth. And it's based on the fact that when our ancestors were told they were free, they had a little bit of time to make monumental decisions for their life with little information. And so our goal, again, is to make Juneteenth more than a festival, more than the entertainment, the red soda water and the barbecue, um, to be about empowering the individual to think about their future. So it's our health fair, job fair, college recruitment, and our informational resource giving fair. Um, that allows people to decide, you know, maybe I should start a business or maybe I should get this level of insurance. Maybe I should make some financial decisions for my life. Because one of the things that the pandemic did is it made folks side hustles become their main hustle. And so now we've got a lot of entrepreneurs who are out there kind of struggling, trying to, and they don't have to reinvent the wheel if they apply themselves and invest some time in building themselves with fairs like this. And so that's the empowering you. Uh, of course, there's her walk. Her walk is on the 19th of June, um, that Monday. So we're asking everyone to come and be with us in person. If you're in DC, there is an Opal's Walk in DC. There's one forming in Austin, a branded Opal's Walk. And then there's virtual. So everybody across the whole globe can walk with us on the 19th of June in support of recognizing that Juneteenth is more than just a holiday. And so um, they can go to opalswalk.com. There is a registration fee, but they'll get a commemorative t-shirt as well as, and we've got to talk about it, $6.19 goes to the building of the National Juneteenth Museum in Fort Worth on land that to hold her or held her uh, local Juneteenth Museum. So we'll get to talk about that in a minute. But we wrap up because we believe in celebrating freedom from the 19th of June to the 4th of July. Actually, we do it the whole month. But um, we have our barbecue cook off. And then on the 1st of July, we have what's called our Taste of Juneteenth. And that's our festival, our food festival, where we're going to have all of the aspira, uh, African diaspora. Um, between Afro-Latin, Jamaican, African, um, then soul food, of course, um, and have all our vendors and retails out there to, again, celebrate the culture of Juneteenth um, and the heritage of the African-American community. So we do it. We do it big in DFW, um, but we have all of that because all of it touches every part, spirit, soul, and body. So all parts of it are, are covered this month. I love it. I'm looking forward to participating as well. So we'll talk more about it. Um, I know that I, I got to give a shameless plug to our chef here in Dallas that did an amazing job of trying to incorporate the foods. I know we had a lot of individuals uh, talk about that earlier as well. Uh, one of the other questions I had about the, that impact, right? Um, what, what are some things that you can give to the audience or the listeners uh, that will be listening to this stream as far as in, if they have, they're passionate about something? Uh, what should they be doing in now allowing it just to be about focusing on Juneteenth to some of your points? How can they expand that into other areas? What, what would you give them as words of advice or encouragement? The one thing that I want everyone to do, my grandmother has said it over and over, Juneteenth is not a point, just a point in history. Mm -hmm. It did happen for us here in Texas um, on June 19th when the enforcement of the emancipation came. Um, a lot of folks like to think that the slaves and how can we be celebrating them being told late and not knowing? We actually knew about the emancipation, but who was going to enforce it? Who was going to make the you know plantation owners abide by it? Texas was so far away, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until Union soldiers made a had to make a stop. They were actually on their way to Mexico, but had to make a stop in Galveston. And they noticed that this part of the country isn't abiding by the laws. Wow. And so they had to issue um, General Order Number 3 as a executive order from the, from the executive branch. Here in Texas, you are made aware that now we have this going on. So when you think of that, 
then as a national significance, people are like, well, why are we celebrating Texas's independence? That's, that has nothing to do with us. We have to understand that Juneteenth represents not just freedom and emancipation in Texas, but when it came across the nation. And there are four distinct times. When, one, when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, it only freed the slaves in the rebellious states. And it specifically says that. There are border states that still had slavery that it wasn't abolished until the ratification of the 13th Amendment. Okay? So they went, you know, a whole almost three years mm -hmm. with slavery in the border states. And then there was still um, a treaty that we had to do with the Indians in Oklahoma mm -hmm. because our laws didn't apply to their sovereign land. Right. So we did treaties with the five tribes in Oklahoma in June 14 of 1866. So when you think about emancipation in totality, then you can see where emancipation moved across the country. Matter of fact, Florida celebrates May Day. That's May 20th. Mm -hmm. And so we're not asking each individual state to give up their date of when it came. But let's have one single day that we celebrate freedom for everybody. And just like we have Christmas. Christmas is December 25th. Jesus wasn't born December 25th, but it's the day that's globally chosen to celebrate a fact, right? Yes. So that's the thing with Juneteenth. It's about celebrating that freedom of the enslaved and making sure that we recognize it whenever it came and be grateful that it did come. So that's the thing that I want folks to, to really take advantage of is organizing the celebrations that are one, spiritual, two, educational, and then of course, three, front. Ours is in educate, entertain, and empower mm -hmm. is what we celebrate here in DFW. But across the country, as folks start having Juneteenth celebrations, the one thing, the other thing is to be inclusive. Juneteenth also celebrates, um, and the National Juneteenth Museum is gonna be a, a hallmark for it, but celebrating the, the champions that work for in, um, freeing the enslaved. When you think about the Quakers who, you know, risk their families, their lives, all right, their livelihoods to help people go north, or the Mexicans, the Southern Underground Railroad into Mexico, because Mexico abolished slavery before the U.S. did and before Texas wanted to. Texas got tried to get away from Mexico because they didn't want the slavery anymore, and then it went to the U.S., and then, oh my gosh, in the U.S., now they're getting rid of it. Oh my, so again, the Mexicans um, are still celebrating Juneteenth. There's villages. Um, we were going to go visit, but because of, you know, the tummy tuck situation got kind of dangerous. We didn't get to go. Um, but there is a village in Nacimiento, Mexico, wow. that still celebrates the Day of the Negro, June 19th. And so, again, it's a global celebration of freedom. Juneteenth is more than a Texas thing. It's more than a black thing. It is freedom for everyone. And that's you know something that she's always said and something that I do believe as well. Because when we can work together, we're stronger together, it's not about giving away our holiday. It's about helping folks understand the heritage and the meaning of Juneteenth and being able to find themselves in the Juneteenth story. So Juneteenth is for everybody. And we're going to actually transition. And that was a great response. That answered a lot of questions that I had. But I want to give the audience an opportunity to ask some questions. So we'll have uh, some mics come up and be available to y'all, those who want to raise their hand and be identified and get a chance to ask some questions. We've got one from the Dory. OK. What community support has inspired you to focus on Juneteenth? I didn't hear it. What, what community? community support has inspired you to focus your efforts on Juneteenth? What inspired me? What, what community co support? Community support? Mm -hmm. Has inspired you. <laughs> <laughs> I've told you. I've, I've had the support of every person I've come in contact with. I really have. Nobody refuses to accept the fact that freedom is for all of us. And ain't none of us free until we're all free. And we ain't free yet. So we got work to do. We can't rest on our laurel. We have work to do. 
And I think it's been really great to see the corporations, even before it was made a national holiday, mm -hmm. you saw the companies, um, I, I call them early adopters, yes. right? That, you know, came on board to make it. Now, we have to give honor to the fact that um, George Floyd's death right before that in May really gave it the shot in the arm. Even though we had our campaign, um, I, I made the, um, online petition on change.org mm -hmm. in October of, of 2019. And it wasn't until George Floyd's murder did we get this shot in the arm. People were looking for a way to voice their support of the African-American community. Um, the fact that things were happening that were just constantly barraging and they found her petition. And that is, and then of course P. Diddy got us over our desire, which was for 1 million. But still, they were looking. And, and I call her the little drop of water, like the Grand Canyon that, you know, eroded away, just consistently doing something, not because it was a knee-jerk reaction, not because, you know, it was the, the thing to do, but because it was something that she was passionate about. And I think that if we as individuals hold on to our passions and not let um, circumstances and obstacles and, you know, jobs and, you know, stop us from what we want to do, you still got to keep a job to pay your bills. But find a way to make your passion and your purpose align. Um, then if you don't give up on that, you'll see the fulfillment and you have a sense of fulfillment in yourself. Um, but she was there just and so folks were able to find um, that she had been walking and find, you know, her petition because it wasn't a knee jerk. It was already there. Um, so you will be found, you know, just do what you do. Don't do it for glory. Mm -hmm. Don't do it for a pat on the back. Don't do it for somebody to see you. And as God says, you know, you will be lifted up in due season. But let me tell you that in Fort Worth, we're going to put up the National Juneteenth Museum. Yes, do you hear me? The National Juneteenth Museum. So we're raising some $70 million. And on my birthday in October, the seventh day of October, they're going to take those spades and turn that dirt. We're supposed to be in that building 2025. Now we've raised $40 million in Fort Worth. So when I come to you, global, Google, <laughs> and asked you for some money with my hat in my hand. Don't say you ain't got no. <laughs> we have a question from the audience. Okay. Um, so I know that in addition to teaching, um, can you stand up? Yeah. I suppose. There you go. And say your name if you don't. My mind. name's Levon Sear. Um, in addition to teaching, you created groups to support people's needs. Um, the Human Dignity Group that you created, um, the Food Bank, now you have Opal's Farm. What belief was sort of your guiding principle to always endeavor to support your community? With all that you've done and all the organizations that you've been on, what was really your driving force to be the humanitarian that you are? No, honey, listen, if you've taught an eight-year-old who's hungry, they can't learn if they're hungry. I had children. How am I going to let somebody else's child go hungry if I can keep from it? And I can, if I got the resources. And that's what I want you young people to understand. You don't have to do anything spectacular. Help an old lady like myself across the street. I look after the kids for the mother who has to go to the store, to the doctor. Small things end up being so important to what we are doing. We are our brother's keeper. I could say it over and over and over again. Let's get together. Don't worry about what I look like. I ain't worried about what you look like. <laughs> so let's get together. 
Let's change people's minds. Let's make our country the best country in the whole wide world. Ms. Sims, I know you're here and I know you kind of offer a reflection of sustainability and legacy. Can you explain or elaborate on the importance of that, especially with Juneteenth and Opal Lee's legacy? I think that um, when my grandmother's gone, um, she is 96, but she's got to stay here long enough for the museum to be uh, opened and, and then on into it so we can celebrate her 100th birthday there and all kinds of things. But what I want people to remember about her when Juneteenth comes around is that they participated in an Opal's Walk. And I think her legacy um, that I'm wanting the nation to see is that when Juneteenth comes around, are we still having an Opal's Walk or did it die because Miss Opal died? Just like we have a Macy's Day Parade every day, you know that Christmas is on its way. I want Juneteenth and an Opal's Walk every year to go a temperature check. Are we free yet? From the time that you know the bill was signed in 2020, have we made any progress? Are we still, do we still have human trafficking, which is a, a form of slavery? Are, are we any closer to being united in purpose, in humanity on Juneteenth to take a look and see? And with each Opal's Walk that we do every year, we're taking a temperature check on the, on the status of our nation because if we don't stop the division that separates us, we're gonna fall apart and be overtaken. And if we don't teach history, accurately, the young people are doomed to repeat what they don't even know has already happened because there won't be anybody here to say, don't do that because we took everything out of the history books. We, we're not talking about it. We're not telling our young people right from wrong based off of what we've already come through. So Juneteenth has to be more, I've said it before, has to be more than a festival. It's gonna be on the calendar perpetually but what does it mean? What does it symbolically stand for? Um, and that's what I'm wanting her leg, because she's a great humanitarian. She, before she was the grandmother of Juneteenth, just as she said, she worked and worked for the human good. And that's what the people in, back in the 1800s did. They didn't do it to be seen. They did it because it was the right thing to do. It was the humanity factor of seeing other folks enslaved and beaten and, and mistreated that drove people to risk their lives and families. You see what I'm saying? So it's about the human being. And Juneteenth has got to still and remain about the human soul. And if we don't do something to help heal America, America is going to die from the division that so easily is tearing it apart. So. That's the legacy and the sustainability of Juneteenth. It has to become relevant today. It's not just about yesteryear. Juneteenth has got to become relevant about freedom and maintaining those freedoms. And, and dare I say, helping to propel people to serve the cause of freedom. You, you can't be a part of the problem if you're not willing to be a part of the solution. And that means serving. There's a, there's a whole decline in volunteerism in this nation. We're very self-seeking and very self-serving as a nation, but we still need people on the school board. You know, we need folks on the book review committees, helping folks not ban books. We need folks to be, you know, on the city councils, helping to undo redlining, right? We need to be in this state, on the US. And one of the things that we do when we talk to schools is we encourage those graduating seniors. Do you know you could be president in 17 years? At 35, a person could be president. And so we really need you to watch your social spaces, okay? Retweeting and sharing crazy stuff can come back and bite you on Google, all right? Um, can come back and bite you uh, when you're wanting to step into those spaces and folks can't take you seriously or they take what you, you know, thought was funny and you posted, you know, something else and it 
you know, disqualifies you in the eye of public, in the public sphere. So we really need to use the technology, all right, to, you know, better our, our stand in the future. But that's, you know, the thing is, we've got to be a part of the solution. And you've got to have people that don't just, you know, backseat quarterback laws and policies, but being a part of the situation. So when we look at the millennials and the next generation, you're actually asking them to get involved, yes. be active, and go on the website. That's a great way to get engaged right now, right? Definitely. Um, from, for us, from a national Juneteenth perspective, um, please go out to the national Juneteenth nationaljuneteenthmuseum.org and see what we're building, see what we're building for the nation. It is more than just a museum. It is actually a, a redevelopment and a revitalization structure for the historic South Side. You want your purse? Yeah. I know it. Wait, 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 wait. Don't go away. Hold on. I can tell, I can tell, I can tell, I can tell. All right. We're getting the purse. I would love for you to elaborate on the kind of the vision here it is. There you go. I don't leave home without it. <laughs> I tell you I don't. And let me find it. Show you. For y'all that can't see it, this is a National Juneteenth Museum brochure. So I'm sure there's So these photos. are our renderings for the National Juneteenth Museum. And the goal of it is, again, to provide space. Um, of course, it have galleries. But it also will have an incubator for small businesses to learn and to have a place for them to grow. It'll have a food hall um, that's going to have six businesses, uh, restaurants inside of it. Um, it will have um, a theater um, for the community, um, lots of outdoor space. Um, and it will also have a um, uh, residential units. So because Miss Opal believes in housing, right? So it's all a, it's a conglomerate community in and of itself to provide um, resources uh, to the to the uh, community. Is that the one? No, that's not the one you like. There you go. Keep, there it is. Can you see that? I almost look like the Google Play. Can, can, can you see it? <laughs> I tell you, and everybody can be a part of it, you see. The president gave me a check for $6.19, he sure did. <laughs> Shucks. All right. I'll show him some more. We, we do have time limit, so I'm going to do a, a fun kind of rapid fire question for, for you, Miss Opal Lee, or Grandma. And we're going to ask you a few few things just to kind of get an idea. We know that you love food. So what's your favorite food? I'll eat anything but yams. Anything but yams. <laughs> anything. And I, I had a few friends. I won't say any names, but they wanted to know one of your favorite recipes. If you don't mind, we'll talk about that offline. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but uh, what was your first job? Oh, I was a babysitter. My aunt was a cook for a family. And so she had this, my cousin. And so it was my job to see that the baby was taken care of while my aunt was doing the cooking. Hey, I tell you, I did a good job taking care of that kid. <laughs> I got paid. All right, we know we're in Texas, so what's your favorite season? Season? Yeah, like season of the year. Oh, they're all nice. And in Texas, they're usually kind of mild. Hot as the summer is, I like it. I almost try to say spring, you okay. know, in yeah. between. I like usually spring. short, usually mm -hmm. short, not long enough here. And my last one is, what's your favorite word? Word? Yeah, you're, you're an English w -O -R -K teacher. W-O-R-K, word. W-O-R-D, word. No, word. Word, freedom. Wow. <laughs> <laughs>